life takes its toll when fate treats you bad. You used to be king, but now you've been had. Alone with your fool, you think you'll go mad. It smells to death of the rain. A stomp through a storm is what I'd advise. When people you trust tell nothing but lies and kidnap your friend and gouge out his own. It's <laughs> nice to take a look at your You sound all daughters, are evil plotters. A bit to that to show will we'll keep you sane. When all has been said and all have been slain, it's good to take a walk in the rain for several hours. Helps to have a howl in the rain without your clothes on. Nice to take a walk in the rain. You're listening to the Press Plus One Slings and Arrows Season 3 Rewatch Podcast. Aaron? Hello. Do, do you think we can call this a rewatch? Yeah. Yeah, but we just, we're just we just watching it for the first time. Is this is this a, a watch podcast? That seems weird. Yeah, but it came out like a long time ago, so no one's really watching it at the same time. Everyone's sort of re-watching it when it already came out. Okay, I'll buy that. Okay, so you're listening to the Press Plus One Slings and Arrows Season 3 Rewatch Podcast. Our next episode, and as you probably know, there are only three seasons to Slings and Arrows. So on our, our fourth uh, episode... We're hoping to talk a little bit about the show as a whole, all three seasons, and whether the series should go on and be, uh, should, you know, there's been talk about whether this should go on to be, you know, more, more seasons and more episodes, or whether it's just beautiful the way it is. And we're, we're working on getting a special guest uh, to come on and, and talk about the show, hopefully one of uh, one of the people for in you know in the show or one of the show creators. Um, uh, we've heard news that somebody you know could hopefully do it if it works with their schedule. I'm gonna really keep my fingers crossed as it's one of my my most favoritist characters on the show. So anyway, I'm gonna leave it at that. Um, you can leave your comments on pressplus1.com um, on our Slings and Arrows articles, anyone, it doesn't matter. Um, we're also on the home page. Uh, we have a, a Slings and Arrows section, so uh, which we'll leave up all summer so that if you aren't watching the rewatch with us now, you can watch the rewatch with us later um, and, you know, kind of follow along with the podcast as you watch the series. Um, we really do want to hear what you have to say, so leave your comments, leave some feedback, and, and if you leave some before our next episode, um, we'll definitely be able to, to read them in the episode. Also, I wanted to mention, I don't know if I have mentioned this previously, that Slings and Arrows is currently playing on Netflix, so if you don't have your own home copy, you can watch it on Netflix and, uh, and, uh, get caught up that way. So hopefully you've watched season three, the final season this last week, and uh, and we are ready to talk about it. My name is Kinda Mardambe. I'm the publisher of Press Plus One, and my co-host today is Aaron ba Bala. Say hi, Aaron. Hello, everyone out there in podcast land. He's one of our TV aficionados, um, and we're we're diving into Canadian uh, Canadian television. Which is hugely popular right now, yes, Aaron? Oh, always. Uh, well, it's actually gotten a really resurgence lately with uh, a lot of American shows picking up Canadian shows in the last few years. It's uh, it's grown tremendously, to be honest. Aaron is going to do the season three overview. Take it away, Aaron. All righty. <coughs> so, following the extremely successful run of Macbeth, which they performed in season two, which landed them on Broadway. This season, the New Burbage Theatre Festival is doing a highly anticipated performance of King Lear. Artistic director Jeffrey Tennant, however, finds himself cracking for no good reason, bursting out crying while giving speeches and having trouble in bed with his girlfriend, actress Ellen Fanshawe. With every actor wishing to get the part, Jeffrey finally selects his boyhood idol, Charles Kingman, to play King Lear. With Charles cho chosen, the rest of the cast for Lear assembles, including a friend of Ellen's who's found success on television, Barbara, and a rising ingenue, Sophie. Jeffrey's frenemy, Darren Nichols, returns as well to perform a new musical, which festival director Richard Smith-Jones takes an immediate and aggressive interest in. Now, to help him through his struggles, Jeffrey starts to see a priest who moonlights as a therapist, 
It is at one of these sessions that Jeffrey has his vision of deceased former artistic director Oliver Wells. But things are different this time. Oliver is unhappy and wishes to move on to the afterlife, unsure why he's still stuck in this world. The cast of King Lear suffers tremendously under the tyranny of Charles, constantly belittling and correcting the other actors, especially young Sophie. Jeffrey tries to confront Charles about his behavior, but learns that Charles is dying, and has only a few months left to live, making Lear his final performance, and it must be perfect. He's on a number of different medications, including heroin. However, now, it is an entirely different story under Darren's musical production, where after some initial friction between Darren and Richard, the production is a resounding success, exciting Richard to intolerable levels. He increasingly hangs out with the cast and crew, getting drunk and high and neglecting his work duties. Rehearsals for King Lear, however, continue to go poorly, with Charles' behavior growing increasingly worse, bottoming out when Charles starts to interact with the ghost of Oliver, scaring Jeffrey. Given the continued cancellations of performances, Richard is forced to switch productions, moving the musical to the main stage while King Lear is pushed to the tiny 150-seat auditorium. Assistant director Anna Conroy correctly deduces that Charles is suffering from cancer and offers her help to, keep to Jeffrey to keep his medication straight, which ought to help with his performance. But word leaks that Charles is dying, causing the board to cancel the King Lear production entirely, fire Jeffrey, and reprimand Anna. Charles is adamant, however, to do the performance one last time, so Jeffrey borrows the foyer of the priest's church and gets the cast and crew assembled for a final performance. Charles apologizes to them all for his behavior, especially Sophie. But Jeffrey's worried that Charles won't, make, won't be able to make it through the whole play. But he performs wonderfully, giving a show for the ages for the small crowd that attends. In his dressing room, Charles asks a vision of Oliver for what notes he would give on the play before he closes his eyes and passes. Anna ends up quitting the theater, but not before taking Richard down a peg for letting himself be seduced by the drugs and partying of the artistic life and turning into a fool instead of a human. Uh, Jeffrey decides to start up the theater sans argent again after uh, season one. We got to see them. He's starting it up again. And finally, after three seasons, Ellen and Jeffrey finally get married and they hold their reception in the bar with all of their friends ending the show. Well said, Aaron. Um, what did you think of season three overall? And now that you've seen all three seasons, what would you say is your favorite season? Um, I think going back, I did prefer season two best. Uh, I thought season three was good, though. And uh, gosh, like as soon as I saw it, I was like, there's there's a lot of they threw some money at this show for the final season. You can you can see it. But um, I thought season two was best. Season three was good. And I think m season one was probably the, the worst out of the three, I, I want to say. Um, yeah, I thought this was really very interesting because here you have um, uh, William Hutt, um, who is one of um, Stratford's most well-loved um, actors. Uh, so this show was done in 2006, and he plays Charles in the season three in, in 2006. And then the following year, he passed away. And there's, um, there's like a commemorative bridge that you go over in Stratford. It's the William Hutt Bridge. And I really haven't known much about him. He was just before my time at Stratford. And, uh, and so I've, been, I've always kind of been curious as to who he was and, and, and what type of a person that he was as an actor. And, and so this, to me, shed a lot of light on who he was as a person or a per, you know a personality on on stage um and i re i really did like him I, immensely i thought he played Ch charles wonderfully um but i i liked the fact that this is lear this is the final this is the final season uh lear you generally play as as an actor just like charles it's it's kind of the penultimate it's the thing that you 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 aspire towards the end you have to become you mature to a certain age before you perform it um and 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 just kind of wrapping up jeffrey's story as well and and oliver is going into the afterlife so this seemed to me just it seemed very very poetic no i really liked it. i think especially i was happy with oliver finally having something to do this season that was the shame for me in season two is that Oliver was less present. And, and even though 
in this season, he kind of takes a bit of a back seat. He still has these enormously funny moments and enormously funny lines. So when he is present, he's he's a he's he's got some of the the wittiest and funniest lines. And can I just say, I I, I I'm gonna call the funniest moment of the season, although there were quite a few in my opinion. For me, it was Oliver hanging in the office. I think my funniest moment was when uh, Charles disappears into the storm and Jeffrey rushes to his house and he can't find him. And he asks Oliver, where is he? And, Char- and Oliver says, he went out into the storm. The irony is heartbreaking. <laughs> yeah, that, uh, <laughs> that is also a very good moment. I thought it was funnier this season, to be honest. Uh, there were a few moments I was definitely laughing out loud, where I think the past few seasons I had, a, I had some good chuckles, but this one was definitely laugh out loud material. Um, Richard getting the BMW at the at the top of the epi- at see episode one, I thought was hilarious. There, there he is bad mouthing Mister Archer, and he's like, uh, "We just arrived to give you a BMW." Yep. And then the self loathing that he had with that because he doesn't feel worthy of success that just was hilarious. Um, the other funny moment was uh, Richard and Darren interacting, and just like the level of hate emanating off of Darren for Richard and I've seen that in other people in my life and I think my favorite line out of that was uh, Richard trying to give Darren direction and Darren just putting his hand and being like speak more quickly (laughs) that killed me slayed me I loved um, Kenneth Welsh having an emotional breakdown because he didn't get the role of King Lear (laughs) That to me was just that was mint. Um, and and I loved Anna's line to Charles when she says, you know, basically smarten up or I'll I'll smack you so hard your cousin will fall down. Yes, I'm using that one a lot. Channeling Granny Conroy. I, and in inappropriate moments too. I'm like, you know, it's like, would you like cream with your coffee? Listen, young lady, I will smack you so hard your cousin will fall down. <laughs> It's inappropriate moments, but I'm just finding excuses to use that line because I love it. And you know what? It makes everybody laugh. Everybody I use it on. <laughs> Never a problem with that. And then and then I have to just mention Anna buying the pot uh, from Maria. Um, and Maria thinking that it was a proposal for... Um, a proposition. An indecent proposal. And uh, and that was awkward and weird and ugly and hilarious. I love that. Oh, I have a little note here, and I forgot to mention this in my funniest moments. It's just right across the season, but they call Richard Big Dick. Yeah. I'm surprised they haven't started calling them him that sooner. Yeah. Oh, really? <laughs> I just, every time, every time they said it, I was like, oh, that's a double entendre. That's funny. Well, I like how there's the, some characters that call him that like lovingly and the others that are just really condescending to him about it, especially Mr. Archer. Yeah. Every time it was said in a condescending way, he, he would kind of get this look on his face like, um, that's not how it's supposed to be said, you know? <laughs> yes, yes. You're doing it wrong. <laughs> how, how did you feel about Jeffrey's story and his arc and how that kind of came together and the therapy sessions? I liked the therapy sessions. I liked. I, I felt he was a little more unhinged this season compared to last, which I appreciated. I think he was probably at his best in the first season, just being the most unhinged, the most crazy. Um, I felt maybe it was a little flatter this season than some of the other seasons because so many of the other characters had so much going on. He, he was a little more of a stable force. But I liked him having therapy sessions. I liked that that was kind of how Oliver comes back to him. Yeah, I um, I'm not particularly a fan of of my characters going into therapy. I don't know why, but um, in general, it's not considered for me a particular plot point I like. But I actually feel like in this situation, Jeffrey needed therapy. He needed some way of expelling a conversation between him and Oliver that was less directly between the two of them, but actually had a mediator, and um. And I felt like, just like I said, because this is season three and this is the wrap up of, of the three seasons, I felt like this was this was one of the mo- the most important things to address was Jeffrey's relationship with uh, with Oliver, and it was addressed in in I felt a really really lovely way, and just how Jeffrey is treating Charles and having to take care of Charles. 
And, you know, even doing things that you think are just so horrible, like, you know, like, like shooting somebody up, but doing it so that they don't have any more pain. Um, it, it just, it, to me, those, those elements of his, his ability to care, um, and, and get past, you know, the uglier bits of, of dealing with somebody. Um, for me, the season was really, Jeffrey kind of came, as they say in England, he came up trumps. He really, he really showed his best light as as a human and his humanity and 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 that he was coming to terms with the uh, with Oliver and and how Oliver um and his relationship was both working and 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 departing the uh, the other one of the other storylines um was uh with Ellen and Barbara um Barbara's played by Janet Bailey um, and basically the three sisters as well. That also ties into Sophie's relationship with uh, Paul. Um, and of course, Sophie's played by Sarah Polly, um, who loved the show. Um, and her dad, dad's in the show. What, what are your thoughts on, on the three sisters of Lear? I liked that Barbara was pushing Ellen for something more. I, I think I can appreciate that. And I'm sure a lot of actors sort of question whether they're meant for something greater or if they're happy where they are and then they want to stay there. And Ellen's certainly happy at the New Burbage Festival and doesn't want to move on. But Barbara pushes her and says, no, you can be on TV. You can you can have greatness. And Ellen tries it and doesn't like it at all. But I felt the constant fighting between the two of them, it just, it was too much for when at the end when they just kiss and make up and they're fine now. It didn't feel really earned and I feel like well next week you guys are just going to fight again yeah I that was for me it's like is but is Barbara just an antagonist or like it you know is she is she a is she a what did you say earlier a frenemy you know it's like is she, is she really does she really have Ellen's um you know uh the best intentions for Ellen or or is this actually an uh, an adversary as far as performance goes and she wants her to you know um she she she's you know she's muddying her 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 life up basically i i didn't feel like she was i felt like she was a friend but i felt she was kind of an abusive friend you know like she was um her own issues came before anything with ellen i think for me what sticks to my mind is that uh, is what in the last episode when they're in the washroom changing and Ellen tells Barbara, oh, no, I quit the, the TV show. And Barbara's just like, you're just a mess. Yeah. That's that's what sticks in my mind with their relationship. I love the drunken night uh, between the three sisters. And and that Barbara kind of was a little bit Gonroll-like in, in that night. You know, she was um, she was really hard-edged. And she had she imparted some wisdom that was really cruel and really harsh and, and really... Um, I think, you know, pull down poor Sophie, who, who's already getting pulled down in, in the, uh, in the old, um, in the rehearsals by Charles. Um, I, I, I don't know. I just, I liked that evening because I felt like it was very revealing about Barbara. The parts I did love with Barbara is at the beginning of the season when she just cannot stop talking about her character and what her character should be doing, whether her character would really commit suicide or not. And just, she does not shut up about it. Even at dinner, she keeps going on about it. And I was just like, wow, you are truly like one of those self-absorbed actors. You have, you are not the lead, but you think you are. Yeah. And, um, and just like you say, she's very much a caricature of, you know, she's the larger version of maybe what um, most, you know, actors are like, or she's maybe a, a small percentage that are actually, you know, that's, that's a complete template for them. Um, she, she does seem, um, I don't know, just very antagonizing and very selfish, but I, I do, I did appreciate her response to Charles trying to bully her. She shut him down and it was like, no, this is not going to happen. And you're not going to treat me like this on stage and have some respect. And he never went after her again. Um, but he kept going back to Ellen and he kept going back to Sophie because they never really stood up to him. Uh, the way that Barbara did. He knew that was a hands-off situation. 
Mm-hmm. But, um, so Sophie and Paul, our third young couple love story. Do we have success yet, according to Aaron? Okay, I'll give them credit because they tried to do something different this season. They tried a love triangle, and props for them. You get brownie points. But, man, it did not land for me. Not at all. Um, I mean, uh, If Paul and Megan stayed together, I'm down with that. But then Sophie, uh, uh, I don't know. It felt like, is Paul really this great a guy that he's worth two women fighting over him? I he felt a little shapeless, like he didn't have much of a character, and he's I uh, did not land for me. I was a little sad that Sophie ended up with him. I was like, really, you know, she deserves better. <laughs> That's how I felt about. It. It's like she's a much nicer girl. She kind of deserves, you know, she's caught his eye all of a sudden. He just seems to be somebody who's like he likes talent. Basically, he likes talented people, and when he sees that talent in that person, he's blown away by it, and then that triggers his his emotional reactions and then his you know his relationship reflexes i'll put that nicely um and uh, and unfortunately i don't know i just felt like sophie was a much you know she was a much uh greater person she didn't well i say that but then she does the stink bomb and but they were in it together and he totally screwed her and that was not cool bad friendship. I, I understand the importance of having young, you know, exploring young storylines or, or relationships within the theater. Um, and probably a lot of them are relationships, like who's with who, because, you know, in your 20s, maybe that's a bigger focus, you know, um, than maybe some of Ellen's storylines um, about being in the theater and being an actress and, you know, and her performance and, and kind of where she goes next after this. Um, but I felt like, like, I really loved the story of Sophie and, and Charles and, and Ellen and everybody just trying to, to, to train her to be something. And, and I would have preferred that just have been the plot line. There are so many aspiring actors going to, to the stage and, and you see some of them have, have just, complete clear focus and dedication and they are building their careers and they're just real go-getters and I would have liked to have seen you know something like that or even if she was somebody who had been given a part that she felt was maybe too big for her but she wanted to try and give it the justice that she did mind you I do have to make a little side note here um her 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 actually being in Lear um and and that performance at the end, I thought she was she was actually fantastic. I'm like, I'd have bought I'd have bought a ticket for that. I was like, oh, Sarah Polly's very good at Shakespeare. That's good to know. Well, I, I think with the young actors part, I did kind of like their little feud with the musical actors. I thought that that felt a little realistic. That you're doing Shakespeare and you're going to think you're higher minded than some little musical that no one's ever heard of before. I, I like that that kind of feuding between them. But then it, it did make the Paul Megan storyline feel a little bit so this is Shakespeare, this is Romeo and Juliet again. Yeah, I okay, so we're gonna get into that topic now and I, I think this is a good time to broach that topic is is the musicals versus serious theater and uh and the kind of the divide in not just you know, perceptions like the musical people think that they're better because they're they're getting the bigger box offices, you know, numbers and but um and then the the, the more serious theater actors thinking that they have it because they have the credibility. Um I, you know, this to me does seem like a very strong theme worth exploring because you do see this in the theater a lot and it is that push and pull that we spoke about a little bit earlier I think season one we spoke about it like is it or maybe even the last episode quality versus quantity you know do you want um and can you have both I mean the musical theater brings in audiences so for me somebody who loves the theater for its its rawness and 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 kind of that little bit of snootiness that Paul has when he 
he has that sh- showdown with the musical crowd at the at the table but at, like i say every time i go into a musical i'm thoroughly entertained and i thoroughly enjoy it so uh, i don't know where that divide comes in and and what the better thing to do is about it because for me I, i'm more of an average play watcher i want to say like I, i've been to a, a few I, i'll probably go to maybe one two shows a year at most um but for me i don't really have that much of a divide i'm, I'm not that much of a purist i'm like well musicals are hard too people they you know they got to sing and they got to dance like for me it's all it's all entertainment it's all art and i don't know if i i see that divide so much my concern is that with the popularity of musicals we'll have the exact same thing that we see see in movie theaters which is you know all of you know now we just have superhero movies and there's no you know there's no movies that address bigger issues or you know more complex issues than hey a superhero comes in and wins the day because that's what sells tickets um and for me that's where musicals are are dangerous is because they are the showstoppers they are what people pay to go see um it's a sad reflection that that is you know that is our number one priority like you said even if it was a a marvelous mix of both um, I, I think that would be great, but I do see that in lieu of more serious content, people are going and buying tickets of, of just purely entertainment. Um, so that's to me where I, I consider musicals a bit of a threat. Um, I felt the, the, the actors or the characters, uh, in, uh, in this third season, the musical crew were really... Picked on, I don't know. <laughs> you know, they were kind of treated like caricatures or, you know, they, they didn't have much depth at all. Mm-hmm. That's true. And, and I think after the show goes well, they just seem to be partying it up all the time with Richard. Yeah, um, which I found deeply disturbing. Uh, Richard's newfound cool, uh, uh, you know, and he's calling Anna sexy Anna. Oh, man. It, it felt awkward the whole time. But I think that was the whole point. It was supposed to be just like garishly awkward. And uh, and I, I, I mean, I love that. But then I was like, and then for me, like the new low was when Richard had the threesome. I was like, no, no, don't, don't Richard's, you know, no. <laughs> so that was a new low for me was, 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 was that. But I... I think it was funny because Richard has such, he wants to be in the musical so bad. Um, and he, he, he was easily lured. Again, we go back to this conversation. Richard is, you know, he, he's so easily, you know, uh, persuaded by things. And, and this was the, his new thing to be persuaded by. I mean, I can kind of understand in the sense that, like, this was something Richard has wanted since since last season. He's wanted to be more a part of the 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 artistic side of things and i guess he just kind of went too far oh yeah but that's the richard thing right mm, that is true as well it's very true to care he loves the deep end why don't we talk a little bit about um charles and kind of the evolution of charles and and how you felt about that well under my highlights i listed how do i feel about charles because i thought they really especially in the first half they played it really well in terms of I see this guy, he's at an old age home helping to produce some performance of, I think it's a Midsummer Night's Dream. And, you know, you feel a little sad for him. And then he comes to New Burbage and the next scene I see of him is him shooting up with heroin. I was like, whoa, what's going on here? And then you find out, and so I'm like, well, maybe he's not so sympathetic. He's a drug abuser. He's he's hooked on drugs. I'm I'm scared for his character now. But then you find out, no, he's dying of cancer. I'm like, oh, well, now I feel bad for you again. I it was a fun topsy turvy. Like I didn't know if I should trust Charles or not. Yeah, and he was super aggressive as well. So yeah. you yeah. know, I think it it was making it him very hard to like and and I kind of like that um that kind of tension that was built yeah. into yeah. his performance. Um I I I I mean, I felt it was very um Mm, very good to address but very sad like just so I just I felt just every time just every episode it was just it was such a sad storyline and and I I don't know I just I, I, I felt so much empathy and so much um um 
uh, connection between what Jeffrey was doing and, and where he was at and how he was more the caretaker, like more for, I felt, I think I felt more about Charles through Jeffrey. You know what I mean? Like not so much just Charles on his own going through his own decline and, and, and harsh reality. Um, there is a line he, he says in, in the show. And I, I just thought this was perfect. He says, like the theater, I'm boldly fighting a slow, undignified death. And I just thought this is, this is exactly what, you know, what Charles is going through. This is exactly what he's experiencing. And, and, and just having Jeffrey's reaction to that and how he's, he kind of champions him. Um, he protects him. Um, he he helps him through, you know, his physical um, issues, um, and and just ultimately, he's just completely there for him. And and I just felt like it was Jeffrey's, you know, Jeffrey's seeing seeing Charles through Jeffrey's lens that made us feel more empathy for that character. Mm -hmm. Especially knowing that Jeffrey says it was because of this guy I even got into the theater. My dad took me to see a show that Charles starred in, and my dad hated the theater, but because I saw Charles doing it, I loved it and made it my career. I thought the ending was, and I mean the whole ending, not just the production, but also the production, um, was was absolutely superb. Like I thought it was a fantastic way to end the show. I thought that um, the production at a church, um, you know, I mean, he, you know, the show must go on, you know, it's, it's the Noel Coward song. It's like the show must go on. It's like, no matter what, um, and no matter, you know, what, what, how this is going to transpire, he was going to make sure Jeffrey was going to make sure that Charles was Lear for at least one time. See, that felt a little too TV for me. It felt a little like, for the last, like, I don't know, three, four months, we've been trying to put you on as Lear, and it's failed every time. You literally just came out of the hospital. But no, no, you can do it one more time. We're all going to rally behind you for it. It felt a little too Hollywood for me. I I, I did like it. I liked how it it was tidied up in a neat bow. There could have definitely been things that were, were left open. Um, Anna got fired um, by Richard. Uh, Jeffrey loses Oliver or, or lets Oliver go. I don't know which way to think of it, but you know, I didn't like the wedding thing. Like I felt that was all of, that was too sudden for me. Like Jeffrey and Ellen getting married. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa let's slow down here, folks. I bought it. They're kind of old. They're running out of time there. They, they should get together. But I mean, uh, y you end your series with a wedding. I've seen that one before, but you know, it works for the characters. I bought it. They're kind of old. They're kind of old. Nobody else will have them. <laughs> so they have to marry each other. Oh, that's a good plot point. Um, speaking as uh, as an older person than you, I'm offended. <laughs> <laughs> it was too much of a nice bow. Like he was going off to get married. And uh, I think it would have been nicer to have had him going off to uh, Charles's funeral. Um, as opposed to his wedding and or not Charles's wedding, Jeffrey's wedding. Um, so I, so yeah, I just I think that would have been a, a, a nicer, uh, more fitting. I just felt like the Ellen thing; it was like super rushed. Or like if she'd have, if she'd have come in maybe um, as he was walking out, and she would have like held his hand, like it would have shown a solidarity, but not like a, a rushing to the altar thing. Well, that's what they did at the end of the second season, though, where she just kind of holds his hand, and that's how we know they're okay again. <gasps> then that would have been perfect. I have redone the ending of Slings and Arrows. I think we should go into shooting straight away. That is a wonderful way to, because it's always nice to echo something from, you know, previous seasons. So I think that works out well. Yeah. No, wedding all the way. Wedding. And okay, did you not love, though, that the reception is at the bar where all the opening credits are coming from? And it seems to indicate that's where the opening credits have been. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I agree. I did like that. But that could have also been a wake for Charles. <laughs> do you have any kind of low, you know, do you have any of the, 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 the tragedy parts of it? Um, I have a few low lights. We've kind of covered them a little bit. Uh, Sophie Paul Megan, still not a fan. <laughs> Uh, Richard's arc, 
they gave him a really great role last season. He's he's frantic. He's out of money. He's desperate. And this season, it was almost largesse. It was, we're doing great, so I'm allowed to be a douche all the time now. And I, I didn't like it. He he turned into a bit of a villain from a protagonist. He re really became quite unlikable. And, and um, you know, he would do things that were just ridiculous and awful before. But there was always this kind of element of of um but yeah he was still trying or yes he still cared or you know and i agree with you this 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 i don't think musicals are good for richard i think they you know i think they uh they cultivate a uh an un un unple unpleasant richard uh for sure he he just kind of got in the wrong crowd didn't he mm -hmm. and him and wrong crowd seem to be a thing uh him and uh jennifer Irwin, what was it? holly day in the first season uh, because I think even with that, he was kind of a villain in the first season, a little bit, but he had a redemption, at least, by the last episode. There was really no redemption here. Anna tells him off in the last episode, and he fires her, and that's, that's about it for him. And I wasn't a big fan of the plotline of Jeffrey's, uh, bedroom issues. Um, you know, I didn't, I didn't find that funny or, or particularly entertaining. Um, I didn't like that Ellen just kicked him out of the house, like... You know, Barbara takes precedence. I uh, no way Barbara takes precedence. So, um, I don't know. I just felt that that was a little bit. But it, but then it also revealed that she was like Ellen's very needy to please people as well. Um, and you know, if if uh, Jeffrey's willing to be the one to to you know take it on the chin, then then she's willing to to allow him to do that. So, and and really the um you know, my kind of low, my, my tragedy or low light of the season would be that, uh, Jeffrey isn't obsessing about Lear like he did Macbeth and Hamlet. Mm hmm. That's true. Um, he had just so much going on with Charles and Charles's that, that really the staging of the production was such a secondary factor. And I think they did try to at least do a little bit when they threw him back to the 150-seat auditorium instead of the big 2,000-seat theater. But then, I mean, end of the episode, they just they get rid of the small theater anyway. So what, what was the point? Aaron, we come to the big question. For you, who stole the show? Who stole the show for me? And I, re I regret that he was a little more muted in the second half. We didn't get to see him as much because he, he destroyed me in the first half through comedy and through excessiveness. The person who stole the show for me was Darren Nichols, the best director of all time. <laughs> I am both elated and traumatized by that comment. Loved him. As soon as I saw him in the first episode, I was like, good, we're going to get a whole season with you. You're just, you're just going to be all up in it. <laughs> But then, like you said, we kind of lost him towards the end. And then, and I tell you something, this season, his outfits were outrageous. They were amazing. I'm not going to lie. The other day, I went clothes shopping, and I tried on a tunic. And I'm not a man that wears tunic, and it did not look good on me. But you know what? It works on Darren Nichols. <laughs> I just, I love that the confections just got so much more um, ludicrous every single time you saw him. And it was like, what? What what is he wearing now? Yeah. And then yeah. when he became the new artistic director, I thought that was just because I was like, no, it's like Voldemort winning, right? It's like <laughs> no, not Voldemort. So <laughs> you just if there was a fourth season, it would just end horribly with him in charge of the festival. I think. I also thought it was great when they were uh, interviewing new artistic directors. There was um, Alan Hawker, yeah. yeah. And Anne Marie MacDonald, which is a, a playwright and an, a, an author in Canada. And uh, and uh, I just, yeah, I thought that these kind of little cameo moments. And I thought Alan Hawker was great because I don't think, well, I know for sure he was nowhere near as popular as he is yeah. now. That's what I was thinking. Like, this this was, what, 2007, 2006? No one knew who he was then. I didn't know who he was then. For me, who stole the show? This was a tough one. It's always a tough one for me. I say that every time. Um, I, I had to divide whether it, the value was in the comedy or, or whether it was in the story. Um, because for me, really, really funny moments came out of Richard and, um, and Oliver, really. I thought he had some of the best lines and some of the best moments. Um, but um, 
overall, um, for me, the season, and, and finally I say it, is uh, Jeffrey stole the show. Uh. I know, you've been waiting for it. <laughs> it's okay, some of us realized this in the first season, Kinda. Well, <laughs> it's back to your who stole the show first season. Um, yeah, I, I, every season I've loved Jeffrey. And like I said, if there was ever a character in the show, oh, isn't that ironic? In the first episode, we said who, who we would be or who we are most like in the show. You oh. said Darren Nichols. <laughs> I did. I did. And we came full circle. That's right. And I said Jeffrey. And I, I do think, I think... For me, it wasn't so much what he said, but what he did and and just his, his, you know, his relationship with Charles and and, you know, he just became this completely stand up person and him, him trying to get through his issues and and understand his relationship with Oliver. And I don't know, I just thought I thought that was that was, the you know, his his growth and depth. Um, and that's something I would go back to this season and rewatch is, you know, is, I mean, I love the comedy moments, but definitely how, how he developed as a character and, and knowing, you know, going back, which I'm going to do, go back and watch all three seasons again and just kind of see how he was to begin with and see how that, that ultimate arc went throughout all three seasons we have a comment left on our Slings and our Arrows podcast on PressPlus1.com. Yay! <laughs> so I'm going to read the comment, and uh, and then we're just going to talk a little bit about it. Um, and then we will be wrapping up this episode. So Jack leaves a comment saying, First of all, this site is impossible to navigate. There are several pages which, once found, any one of them could be the correct place that hosts were imploring people to comment on. None of them have any comments, though. Probably a testament to the confusion generated by this website. As far as the show went, I was more expecting to hear from people were fans of the show. The hosts were pretty critical of the show, despite some late gushing. I wasn't expecting to hear impressions from first-timers. People who voted for this show aren't people who are iffy about it. They love the show. It was kind of uncomfortable to be a fan and listen to these guys trash the material, the actors, and the writing, all while misremembering details and acting like they'd made some big discovery when picking up on a main theme of the show, like the events of the season sort of mirror the events of the play. Oh gosh, really? I'm going to go cry in the corner, so if you hear any sobs, that's what it is. It's just my tears. <laughs> Little uncontrollable sobs. Um, well, I would love to address some of Jack's comments. Um, first of all, uh, the, uh, the t we do a podcast uh, called thetvcritic.org. Uh, um, you can check out that website, thetvcritic.org. And they that's all uh, American shows that are highlighted on there. And you will see that there's a ton of comments on there. Um, so, you know, there are comments left. Something we wanted to do very specifically on Press Plus One was talk about Canadian television shows. And um, I am a little bit saddened to see that, you know, Jack's the only one who's left a comment um, on the site. Um, there is on our homepage, www.pressplusnumeral1.com, um, a little box that says Slings and Arrows Rewatch. If you click on that, uh, the podcast is on there and you can, you know, uh, definitely leave comments there. You found a way to leave a comment on that article. Um, yeah, we're kind of happy wherever you leave a comment. You could leave it under um, one of the Stratford Show reviews <laughs> and just say Slings and Arrows podcast. Uh, we we just we'd love to hear your thoughts and we'd love to hear everybody's thoughts uh, on the show. Um, I was a little bit sad to hear that you know uh, that there wasn't much analysis from Jack um, about the show. I think we've talked about Aaron and I have talked about a few controversial things. Um, within you know theater in general um but again with the show as well so if if there was something that struck you as you know as something worth debate um i would have loved to have heard that those comments before well i mean the other thing i'd say is look nothing's perfect i mean every every tv show has has flaws and criticisms to exploit and to to try and find better jack's trying to say that hey our podcast isn't perfect there's some flaws and criticisms for us to make better 
but um, you know, I, I certainly think as as this the podcast has gone on, we've liked them more and more. I think. I, I'm a fan of the show. I think you're a fan of the of Slings and Arrows. It's just. Um, and I kind of like the idea that neither of us have seen it for the first time, because I think that there will be a lot of readers who haven't seen Slings and Arrows for the first time. And that's something we wanted to do was promote going back into the Canadian television archives and, and, and seeing what there is. I love that Jack left a comment and I would love to hear kind of more of his th- feedback in the future, um, as opposed to just saying, you know, this podcast doesn't work, um, or I expected it to be you know, people who've, who've watched um, it a whole lot more. And there are listeners who, who will be discovering uh, Slings and Arrows for the first time. Well, even if you know it inside and out, I think it's always nice to, to hear someone talk about it with fresh eyes. I think, like he mentions, maybe maybe my, my newly exciting major revelations are, you know, are, are not newly and exciting to somebody who loves the show um, and have or, has already deduced that. Um, but maybe somebody who's just watching it for the first time would be like, yeah, I, I discovered that too, or I felt that way too. So um, we are fans of the show and, and we always start out the podcast with highlights um and then and then any criticisms that we have and uh and so uh we did we do hold off on gushing um until the latter part but thank you jack for leaving a comment we love that we do hope that more people do leave comments about canadian television um uh episodes and and the podcast that we're doing um we are going to be doing future rewatches um and so yeah we 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 do love to hear the feedback let's let's now we have one comment let's get that ball rolling (laughs) um so just to wrap up our uh our do you have any additional thoughts or feedback aaron no i don't think so usually i end this by saying can't wait to see the next season but kind of that's kind of over now so no (laughs) I'm a little bit excited to talk about in the next podcast, you know, what the potential of a season four would look like or what or or whether there should be a season four or, you know, I, I like that idea of it. Um, and again, we're working on a special guest. Um, we hope that our, our schedules align. If they don't, it'll just be me and Aaron again. But um, but we do have, there is something in the pipeline and we're, we're hoping that it works out. Um, uh, we do want to hear your feedback. So please drop a comment on www.press plus numeral one.com. Again, feel free to leave it anywhere, but we do have articles uh, with the Slings and Arrows podcast uh, in them, and you can also find it a uh, direct link on our homepage. You've been listening to Press Plus One, uh, the Slings and Arrows Season 3 Rewatch Podcast, www.press plus numeral one.com. You can also find us on Facebook and Twitter. Um, again, Press Plus and numeral one. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Uh, we have, I think I've thoroughly enjoyed uh, f- learning about Slings and Arrows and, and discovering it and um, and seeing how it correlates to Canadian theatre. How about you, Aaron? No, it's it's been good. It's been very eye-opening. Like I said in the first podcast, we don't always get stories set in the backstage of a, of a Canadian play. And uh, I like seeing these worlds and interacting with them. Great. Thank you very much. Bye, everybody. Only understudy, I can't go on tonight. I'm drinking with my buddy, I'm dead to good and tight. Before they raise the curtain, I'll be higher than a kite. So call me understudy, I can't go on tonight. Tell the cast and crew to break a leg, break a leg. I'll roll me out and up the bloody keg. Go on. He can't go on. I won't go on. He shall go on. I can't go.